Hello and welcome to this webinar from NMIS Skills. I'm Lewis Ross and next to me is... Is a Joe Wilson and uh, today we're going to be chatting about online uh, assessment and really also just to remind you if you want to find out more about the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland then please check out the website uh, and also if you want to sort of know what these webinars are all about, then check out the, the one of the first webinars that is actually on the website that will show you what's in and out of scope. But today we're going to have a chat about assessment. Yeah. Uh, so let's have a look at our learning objectives for today. So we're going to understand how to embed a range of digital technologies to enhance learning and teaching and assessment. And then we'll have a look at how uh, our know-how to, um, to use a range of learning, teaching, assessment strategies to meet the different needs and learning preferences of students. One day I'll be able to say these learning objectives correctly. I'm, uh, and, and these, I'm a the, these, these learning objectives are, are, are drawn from uh, the new standards in Scotland for further education lecturers. But really, they're just as relevant to anybody working in higher education or work-based learning was just to remind you too what's in scope and out of scope what we'll be chatting about here are all of the other tools that you can use uh, to build in assessment to your learning uh, out of scope is the types of tool that you will have locally inside your Moodle or Blackboard your virtual learning environment and also uh, if you're a college Solar the assessment platform from the HQA and for some universities and colleges also turn it in uh, and the marking tools. We, we're not going to talk about these things because we really think you'll have a learning technologist in your own centre that will already be, be training you in that. So we're going to look at the other solutions, the other kind of flexible things that you can do. Yeah. So the first thing that we're going to look at today, if I can get my control of my slides back, is we're going to have a look at Google Docs for assessment. So Google Docs you might be familiar with already. It's a, a platform that allows you to kind of um, basically uh, kind of share documents and use them however you want. Um, but uh, the main uh, the advantage of Google Docs is that you can uh, collaborate on documents. So you can set up some templates, you can then share them with your students and get them to fill things in and then also use it as a feedback tool. So I'll quickly jump out of my presentation here and I'll go over to uh, a Google Doc I've got open here. Uh, just ignore what's on the right there for the moment actually. Close that and come back to that in a bit. Feel close. Um, so, what I can do basically if a student has submitted this to me is I can use a Google Docs as well as a way of like commenting on what they've done. So, you might have kind of seen similar things to this before where you can insert and then we will go down to I've got comments here where I can then put comments into my students. So, um, please make this upper case or something similar to that. So we can do basic things like that. Like you might have seen things like that already with Word and things like that. And then usually you'd then have to send it back to your, your, your students. I think that the, the, the neat thing with, with, with Google Docs and indeed the whole sort of Google education suite of tools uh, is that it encourages different kinds of collaboration mm -hmm. uh, that we could have a whole class actually working on, on on this document along the top you would see them all all coming in we would see who's who's editing which bit uh, and for assessment purposes too at the end of the day using the timeline you could go back and you can have a look to see who's contributed which sentence which answer all of these kind of things so rather than giving rather than giving the class a whole range of different assessments. You, you, you could, if you planned it carefully, give them quite an interesting collaborative assessment, but then using this tool, you can quite quickly unpick and see the individual contributions that different learners have made to show that they've met the, the, the assessment uh, rubric. Uh, but in order to get there, you, you know, as suggested here, you, you should all really go and have a practice with something mm -hmm. like this. It's great for, for team minutes and for a whole range of other things, or even for policy development in it within a college. It's a really useful tool. Yeah, and I'll just show you here is basically you can um, click on the share button, and then I can start typing in people's email addresses. So if I want to share with Joe, I can select him, and I can select what kind of rights I want him to have. So if I want him to only be able to see it, I can just put it as a view. If I want him to be able to make comments, comments, or if we're doing a collaborative thing, we're actually editing the same document, we can choose can edit. So it allows you to have a really fine-grained control over what people can do. 
And you can also do things like getting a share link. So if I click get share link, I can now have a link that I can send to literally anyone um, and they'll be able to access the document. And uh, depending on, on if you've got G Suite or not, you can also restrict it down so only people in your college could access it or everyone in the world can access it as long as they've got the link. So it allows you to do some, some really useful things with um, basically sharing and collaborating and giving feedback as well. So it's, it's a really, really useful tool, I think. Um, so I'm just bringing this back up. So we do recommend you go and give it a try. You can do it with a free Google account. All you need is your own Google account and someone else with one. And then just use that share button, share it, go and give it a go, start typing. You'll see that as someone else is on the document and typing, you'll see it coming in real time. It's, it's really cool. Um, it's a great, great way to start perhaps developing some learning and teaching materials or, a, mm -hmm. or, a, or another assessment for learners uh, and a whole raft of things. And if you don't feel like opening up your own private uh, Google account, you can of course use this as a, as a place where you develop the materials before you then move it across uh, to, to the VLE or to some other, other, other place. Some of this you can do too with Microsoft 365. Uh, and we're in a fortunate position in this college where we have access to, 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 to both of these uh, tools. But we're finding that, that Google Education apps have some, some really pretty unique features that are useful in learning and teaching. Yeah, indeed. Um, so let's talk about the next thing as well. So another Google tool is a thing called Google Forms. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory what it is. You create forms with it. Um, and then you can send them out to people and basically they get a link and then they can fill them in. Now, what that really is useful for is that you can create quizzes. So I open up here, I've got an example quiz uh, that we created. So this is just a simple multiple choice quiz where we've got some questions. Uh, describe the first step in setting tools to uh, center height. I'm not super familiar with um, kind of metal working, stuff like that. So I don't actually know the answers to these, but let's go uh, check tool for center height. That's maybe what it is. Uh, what is the course feed rate? So we can actually have other options where we're, we can type in. And as you see, as I've highlighted there, you can set the questions required or not required. So you can have optional questions. So let's see, what's the course feed rate? It's actually 0 0.7 uh, millimeters per rev. Because we've got to remember our units. I am an ex-physics teacher, so units, units, units. And then more. Um, so what's good with these as well is that they're very mobile compatible. So if you've got uh, a quiz you want your class to do, you can just basically get it on their mobile phones really quickly. You send the link out to them, they just click on it in an email, and then, as I love mobile phones, always got mine nearby because they're a very useful tool to have. You can then get them doing it on there as well so that you're, they're not just um, a tool that's lying around and being unused. Or if you're somewhere where you don't have access to a computer suite constantly, you can get the, your students using the quizzes here. And then um, you can have it so it automatically marks them as in this case i've got zero of these questions right which is really good to see <laughs> so i know nothing about this subject so you can get auto marking as well so they instantly get their feedback or you can have them manually marked where you go in and you can leave comments uh, and mark the questions as well so it's very very flexible and and too you could go down the route of capturing the learner's name uh, because it is a is, is is a form at the back end of this you can have a google sheet uh, and that all of the results and all of the input you could you could be recording so that you could come back and for formative summative or diagnostic assessment uh, you could be you could be feeding all of this data back into into in, into spreadsheets you could then look to see how your class is 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 performing and where there were topics you perhaps need to remediate uh, it would show up quite clearly where some of your learners or all of your learners might need a little bit of extra support. Yeah, and what I'll show you here is actually an, another thing that you can use them for of talking about those, those kind of getting that feedback. This is actually what I designed for some of the hairdressers in the college here, where their uh, students have to do what are things called uh, client consultation records. Every team they see a client, they need to record down the information they got from the client, how they're going to work with that client, details of the haircut they're going to do as part of their assessment process. So it's not a straight correct, incorrect answer. It's more about recording that information. So I created this form for them. We can see it's got client information, things like influencing factors, hair texture and stuff. And adding questions in is really easy. You just kind of hit add question and then you can go in here and edit them, change what they are. It's a very easy tool to use. But what's very cool is I can show you some responses that have actually been sent. So we can see a summary here where we can go down each question and see what people have been answering. We get graphs of like hair textures, how many were coarse and fine. So you're getting some really good data there. We can also see individual responses. 
So I can go through here and we can see what the people have filled out. But what's really cool is if I click on this, it'll automatically take all those responses and generate a spreadsheet. So suddenly you've got all that data available for uh, maybe any external um, verifiers that are coming in, or it could just be for your own purposes of you can then start applying like a filter. So we can then see when the timestamps were and filter them by that. So you can start to then organize this data that your students are generating for you. And just for the purposes of data protection and for client safety, uh, can I say that at no point is loose Ross actually touched anybody's <laughs> ear? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is all uh, kind of fake clients as it were. So let's just close those down and we'll go back to our presentation. Um, so yeah, it is a really powerful tool, Google Forums, because it, it does feed into all the other Google stuff. And if you're really a kind of a whiz with things, um, or if you've got a learning technologist to help you out, you can do things like scripts where it could take information from uh, a Google Doc, automatically generate questions based on that, and then the answers to those questions will then be fed into your spreadsheet. So you can really link things up really nicely. Um, it's, it's a very, very useful tool. I've been loving using it. I, th I think the other nice thing is if, if your experience of, of, of things like this uh, is perhaps something like SurveyMonkey, and SurveyMonkey is, is excellent for, for, for what it is. It's a good tool. Uh, this while it, it reports in a slightly different way, gives you actually a different sort of flexibility. Uh, and it's actually also the kind of tool that would be good to give to students because students, I think, could use the forms to do a whole lot of sampling and work within their own their own studies. Uh, so back to that kind of theme that we've, we've, we've chatted about in, in, in previous episodes, uh, the, a lot of this can also be about collaboration mm -hmm. and co-creation. And back to some of the things we chatted in one of the previous sessions around learning design. Yeah, um, it would be a great tool for flipped classroom. Get your students to go and do their reading at home create a quiz to then give to your other students. Like so many useful things that you can use it for and very, very easy to use as well. If you've never used one of these products, it's literally like drag and, drag and drop and edit. Very, very useful. So we're gonna have a quick little bit of discussion now. So how does Google Forms compare to other ways you currently quiz your students? We've got a few people in the chat, which I will try and get to come up. So um, see if what they have, if they've got any statements, I'll keep an eye on the chat here as well. Um, if other people are using other forms of assessment, ha if, have you used Google Forms or do you like the look of it? Um, have you got any comments on that? I don't know, Joe, how, what do you think about Google Forms compared to like, <laughs> you used to be a teacher back before when it was all paper and pens, so oh, how does it yes. compare? Well, I, I think there's, there's two bits and, I, and I, 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 kind of, I kind of built into this. The, up till this point, I would probably have been using things like SurveyMonkey, but I'd be using it in a, because it takes time to design a SurveyMonkey, takes time to download the data. I probably would be maybe setting one up for a whole course group eh, and, and maybe doing something with that once every 36, once every 40 hours, once per unit eh, to find out the things that I wanted to find out as a tutor. These tools make it so easy to, to, to design forms that probably now I'd be, I'd be sampling. I might even be sampling actually on a class by class basis. You know, so at the end, at the end of the class, uh, have, have I made, have, have, has this lesson made my learning outcomes? So at the start of the lesson, I said you were going to learn this. At the end of the lesson, do, do, do you feel as though you've learned this? Uh, or where, where would you like more information? Simple wee things suddenly become really easy to set up. You know, Google Forms is another form of sort of feedback channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been making a lot more use of, of, of things like this. Yeah, so we've got a couple of questions that come from the chat here. Uh, can quizzes be more interactive, visually engaging? Yeah, I suppose if you're used to having like all these pictures and stuff in your quizzes before, yes, you can. You can insert images, YouTube videos into your quizzes. So you can do really good things of having the video there and then instantly question them about the knowledge they've gained from the video. You can also allow them to upload files to it as well. So that gives you some other options if you're wanting them to be thinking about something, using the form to help them out with it and then upload a worked product, product at the end of it. That works as well. Uh, someone else asking, do you have to know about Excel to use it? No, you don't. Um, the, the spreadsheet side of things is more there for the information if you need it, but you can get all the information in a visual way through the forums itself. So that's, that's really good. Um, can you see our question? Oh, someone's asking if I can see the chat <laughs> question. Yes, I can. Yes, we can uh, see the yes. Uh, what chart options do you have within Google Forms? I'll quickly show you the charts. Yeah, again. but we're doing, there's a whole, whole range of different, uh, Chart, chart options uh, and I need to open up the thing again. Give me one yep. sec. 
So when we go into our responses, basically it'll put them in kind of graph format for us when we look at the um, summary um, section, which I'll just open again. So you get, depending on what it is, you get different graphs. You don't really have any control over these. That's about the only thing. They, they tend to be presented in the best format potentially uh, possible for that thing. Um, and you can copy the charts as well. So I can hit this button, get the charts directly out and then go and paste it in. So if you're reporting back on anything to anyone else in, in your department, for example, really good way of grabbing that data quickly. And you could also use this even for interdepartment communications. If you've got a survey about how things are going with a new system you've set up, then you can get people's feedback, get these charts instantly. It's, re it's really good. And uh, this is available to everyone that's got a Google account and you can create them for free. This is a completely free tool. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's worth too looking at Google Sheets because actually there's a whole range of graphing tools and things that come with a uh, Google Sheets. And, uh, and again, it's quite intuitive to use. You can drag over your data, uh, pick the kind of graphic graphic type that you want, uh, and and you can sort you can sort that into a whole, yeah. a whole, a whole range of formats. And then you can take that that the image, uh, the infographic, or whatever you've chosen. Uh, you can put it. You can use use it for a whole lot of other purposes. Yeah. Um, another quick question: Can you change the colors and header images? Yes, you can. You can customize what it looks like at the top, so it looks nice and visually appealing for the the style you're using. Right, we'll move on. I know there's maybe some other questions people have, but we've got a lot to cover today, so we want to keep going. So one of the, the next things that we're going to talk about is using other forms of online quizzes. We've already seen the one in um, Google uh, Forms, which got people quite excited. There's some other ones as well, and uh, the phrase that Joe used earlier, back channels, ways of getting feedback from people to you and stuff. Um, so one of the first ones we're going to look at is called Kahoot, which is, it was mainly designed for uses in schools, um, but it can also be used in lots of other environments as well. So if I quickly open it up here, this is me logged in. It's basically a little quizzing thing, which makes nice and quick, easy quizzes. So you can design them yourself or you can use ones that Kahoot's already got. So let's um, use my favorite subject, physics, so topic physics. And we can pick uh, subjects, levels. So if you're doing kind of, I think it's organized, these are, I think, American grades. Yeah, I'm not too yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but there are also there's ones in here that could apply to university as well and, and further in higher education. Um, so you can select ones that are already built or you can build your own. I'll use one that's already built here just to give you an idea of how the system works. So I'll open this up now. So we can have a look at all the questions that are there. Uh, we don't want to look at those right now because it might give you the answers. I'm just <laughs> going to quickly open one. So what it does is it basically says, um, let me just full screen this, is now oh, it's gonna play annoying music, so let's just mute that. Um, you can basically join uh, on your phone. So I've got my phone here, so I'll quickly log in. If there's anyone watching as well who wants to join, if you're quick, get to that uh, address, kahoot.it. And you're um, looking at 714-736, 714-736. Yeah, so all you need to do is put in that pin, uh, 14736, and then enter. We'll see if anyone gets in before me. Um, if someone does, they can join in as well. Otherwise, I'm just going to go for it and demonstrate it. So here I am. I'm in. Um, so what I can do is basically start it. And what it will do is it will give us some questions. And so here we go. What term is you describe the location of an object? I'll let you try and answer this one, Joe. I'll need to move my video out of the way because I can't <laughs> actually see. The question. Oh, so what term is used to on my screen, I get describe the things. location of an object. Which do you think it is? Hit the. Oh, the oh and one. it's got to do elbow for position. Position, and then it gives us an answer. Yay! There oh, we go. Very good. And someone else who's in there as well got a, a, an answer. I think. It's a toss up between position and placement. Yeah. I have to say. Yeah, exactly. There's it, this is the thing with physics that some of the terms can be a bit tricky. When we compare the position of one object to that of another object, we are using. I'll let you just take my phone. Just and do a location there. finder. I think that's no, no, it's no, a reference, no, reference point. point there we'll do one more, more and then and then we'll move on because otherwise we could do this all day. Motion is a term used to describe a change in something over time. Yeah, position. Oof. So um, basically, it's a really quick way that you can quiz people. So you could use this in kind of any environment where you're going to have people that you just can have uh, devices. This can also be team modes as well as individual modes. So you don't just have to do, uh, have a one-to-one -one with your devices. I'll just close this now. I think, um, I think oops, I'll stop sharing instead. <laughs> I'll just bring my share back up. Um, 
Sorry, go ahead, Joe. <laughs> I think the, the, the important thing that Lewis is showing there is, is that Kahoot really makes that type of online assessment within everybody's reach. Mm -hmm. And even if you're, if you're feeling a bit insecure about building your own quiz, uh, when you go to something like Kahoot, there, there, there may actually already be uh, in your subject area uh, some quite relevant quizzes, so you, you, could, you, could, you could use them with your class. Yeah, and it is just that quick as you saw me doing it there. The only step that I've missed out is logging into the system. So, I mean, like that doesn't take too long. And then just grab them off the shelf, use them instantly. It's really, really useful. So another one, instead of just doing quizzing, you might be actually wanting to get feedback from an audience or back channels, as they're called. So you might be presenting at a conference for example, and you're wanting to get people to interact with your presentation, or just during your class, you want to quickly get some information from um, your students. So what's really useful for that is a thing called Mentimeter. So I'll just open this up here. Now, uh, Mentimeter, I'll just try and close some of these. Uh, right, give me one second to just close some of these tabs I've got here. Um, one problem with Zoom is it likes putting its stuff on the top. So making tab management difficult. Okay, here we go again. Here comes my screen again. So Mentimeter is a, a way where you can create these presentations. Um, the free version, you can only have two questions, but you can have a paid for version where you can have more. That's two per presentation, so you can always just make more presentations yeah, to get yeah. around that. And what it does is if I bring this up here. Uh, if you're in the audience, go and jump in as well. Joe, do you want to try and get in on yeah, your phone as well? In. So again, you just go to the address that's on the screen. So menti.com. Um, so I'll just do this on my own thing, and then you put in the code. So in that case, it's 8487999. So I submit, and then I'm in. And you can see you'll get the question on your phone. So I'll just hold that up to the camera. Quickly see. Um, and you also get the question on the, the presenter's screen. So you can basically start answering things. So our question here is what characteristics are important in a trainer? Um, and uh, let's say, uh, I have to try and spell now, which is always difficult for me as I'm dyslexic. So we'll just, <laughs> we'll get one in there. Um, and you'll see that things start popping up on the screen as people submit things. So there I put in friendly. Um, and then I can also, um, you can set it so people can put in more than one word. Um, so here we go, nice personality, um, similar concept. Oh, here we go. Here's the audience are putting yeah. some in as well. And as people are voting for that word, it gets bigger in this case. So it kind of, you're getting really nice kind of feedback, a word cloud, you can quickly survey from, from your audience or class, things like this. So it's a very good um, formative feedback tool. Yeah, and um, good, good to use perhaps at the start of a lesson or, or at the end of the lesson to see if, if people, people's opinions or, or, or mm -hmm. positions have moved given the information that you've given. Yeah, it's a, that's a really good idea actually because um, you can save the, the, the kind of information that comes up in, in the word cloud as well. You can export it all as a PDF. So you can then look back and say, right, okay, what was the start and what was the end? And maybe one of these words has become bigger or smaller than the other. Um, and then obviously you can have other um, kind of questions as well. So as I've moved on, if you're still on your phone, you'll see that it's kind of changed over to the next question and people can start putting things in there. Um, so we'll talk about one other one as well. Um, let me just close some of these things, which is slide.do. Uh, or slide do. I'm not sure how you pronounce that one. <laughs> I, I think it's probably slide or whatever. Yeah. I've seen it in, in operation a few times. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, I think probably in terms of technology moving left to right from Kahoot to Mentimeter to now uh, Slido, uh, you, you see the, 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 the technology getting cleverer and slicker. So uh, Kahoot does exactly what it says in the tin. It lets you prepare uh, tests and things that you can do with, with, with your learners. It gives you also a bank of pre-made tests. Uh, Mentimeter, uh, again, to a mobile device, uh, lets you ask a range of questions. And while we showed you one way of reporting back, there's a whole different, different graphs and different ways you can use to report back the data. And Slido kind of takes that on again uh, to another level. Uh, it also lets you crowdsource questions this time. Uh, you can set active polls in a similar way. Uh, and, 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 and again, that bit of rather than just giving you two slides for free, uh, you can get three polls for free through Slido. Uh, so again, quite accessible. It's nice. It operates in a similar kind of way. 
Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think one of the things that you mentioned there that's really worth raising is that you kind of have these polls, as we kind of saw with uh, Mentimeter, but we can also have this question. So you can use it as a way of gathering questions from your audience. So if you're delivering things uh, remotely, or if you've got people who aren't so confident putting their hands up in class, want a way of getting feedback to you, um, you can kind of access questions through here and just send them to the um, your kind of panel if you're doing it as a panel type thing. So there's kind of different ways of getting that kind of back channels in there. Um, I won't go through and demonstrate this one as well because it's, um, it's similar to Mentimeter. Um, so we'll kind of have a look at some of the other things as well. So we're covering everything nicely. But yeah, a, a, a whole bunch of options there that you can, you can use. That's right, we'll move on. So uh, one of the other things that, that, that's kind of very important in assessment is the use of portfolios. Uh, we use them a lot here at City of Glasgow College, um, especially for people like our um, apprentices who are doing working in the construction trades. They, a lot of them need to make portfolios of things they've worked on. Or uh, if we're thinking in the creative industries, so people who are working in hairdressing or who are working uh, doing furniture design, they want to build up a portfolio so when they go and then go and get a job afterwards, they can go, look at all this amazing stuff I've done. It's, it's, it's perhaps useful to maybe to take a moment and chat about the, the evolution of e-portfolios and particularly the evolution of e-portfolios in vocational learning. Uh, in, term, in terms of the range of tools that this college has, uh, we do have alongside Moodle, we have Mahara. Uh, that tends to be used by, let's call it staff with a specialist interest uh, that have seen a use for Mahara and are using Mahara in quite a specialist niche way. We've got a tool called OneFile, and OneFile tends to be used uh, with learners who are on commercial apprenticeships where we have to collect evidence in a very highly structured way against specific outcomes, and one file lends itself to that. Uh, what increasingly, though, we're finding with tools like uh, with, with, with Google Drive, it allows us a lot more flexibility, and we can, we can have a kind of happy Mid, medium kind of house between between that rigid one file e-portfolio and the the more flexible but harder to design Mahara e-portfolio what we find within Google Drive is we can create something that's really flexible uh, and uh, around that actually we've got a whole lot of a whole lot of different programs and developments going yeah so we'll, we'll show you one example here of um, kind of the way that you could use Drive as an e-portfolio so what's happened here is basically we've created a, a template effectively of folders that can be shared with the student. So this has been shared with me by my, my teacher and my agent, my name is actually uh, Lydia Costa. It's not, but that's a, our fake student name. Um, Lyd Lydia's his Saturday name. Oh, yeah. So um, we, we here we've got several folders uh, and basically the student could start putting their the work in there. So for my laser welding work, I could start uploading all my photos and pictures in there so it's nice and ready. Um, for me, when I, I kind of, uh, let me just go back into it. Um, when I want to then start using them in a kind of professional context, I could put all my press forming stuff in there and there. So you can kind of set up these template folders to then send out to your students to help them organize their work. Because a lot of the time when a student first comes in, they won't be thinking of that. It's like, I know when I was kind of studying you can, it's the last thing you think about is organizing all this stuff and then suddenly you're hit with it towards the end where, oh my God, I've got tons of folders and tons of images and stuff. Why didn't I organize this sooner? This can really help to encourage them to do it early of, of getting it um, compartmentalized really. And I think the other, other neat thing is uh, with some of these tools, uh, and this is you then moving right into the kind of educational app set up for Google, with, with some of these tools, you can actually automatically set up all of these folders so that as, as learners come on into Google Drive, you can, you, you, you can share a, a file structure with them eh, as, you, as, as you go along. So they're really ready to hit, hit, hit the ground running. Yeah, and it's, uh, this one's really simple to do. That's, that's a nice, simple option for getting it started. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about another way of setting up these um, portfolios, which is um, this requires a bit more design from your students. So this might require students who are a bit more technically capable or who have a bit more time, which is using a Google site to set up a portfolio. So you can basically create a template site for them, then 
share it with the students so they can edit it, and then they can go in and start putting their things in there. So here we go. Here's the template site that we've created. Um, just uh, for example here, you could have first and last name, and then engineering skills portfolio, and then different sections of it. So we've got our milling skills page, and then when we're editing the site, these are become image containers that we can then paste things in. And with uh, Google Sites as well, it's a very easy, simple kind of drag and drop stuff. If you've been on the nmiskills.org website, that was all built in uh, Google Sites. And I'm not a professional web designer. I did most of the, the building of that. And Joe, you've done some as well. How did you yeah, find using I've, it? I've, I've, I've used a Google Sites quite extensively for a lot of the consultancy projects that I've delivered. So uh, some of them quite big national ones. So delivering uh, web pages or, 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 or the fleshed out web pages for British Council or for Education Scotland, uh, I was able to use uh, Google Google Sites really to build out the, the, the website to, to the point where I just handed it over to a developer and all of the images and all of the text and things were, were all there before it disappeared into the, the, the corporate site. So it works really well. It does work very well. I mean, obviously, this will take a bit more time than just throwing things into a folder in Google Drive. Uh, but this, this could be really great for your kind of uh, students who are in more creative industries who do want that control over how it looks and, and to kind of make it look really great. And then when they leave college, they can send this to their employers and go, look at what I've done. It's an amazing way of demonstrating their skills. And uh, although we've said it needs a bit of embedding, actually you could just embed the folders or you could just embed the documents. Uh, it, 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 works, it works really well, you know, so you could have a lot of nice buttons and nice images and things, or, or you could quite simply just embed some of the some of the Google Docs and some of the things that you have in your folders inside your Google site. It's, it's a really neat way, not just of surfacing learners' work, but actually presenting a, presenting a lot of work. Uh, and, and that's really why we chose it for the NMIS uh, project site. Yeah, a really great tool. Um, so a couple of other things that we're going to look at quickly. Um, is we're going to talk about audio and video feedback. So as well as kind of... A, generating all this uh, assessment information or quizzes and all this stuff, you probably want to give some feedback to students. Um, so the, the, one of the ones that we're going to look at here is called Kaizena, which is a way of doing recording audio feedback. It works as a, an add-on in um, Google Docs. So I'll just go here. I'll just load up my thing. So it basically allows you to record little audio messages for students. And research is increasingly showing that students really get a lot from audio feedback. It's a lot easier for them to understand what you're saying and kind of getting those little points of information from um, the audio feedback. So I'll quickly show you what I can do here is I'll just uh, create a general voice message. Here we go. This is a really good essay, well done overall. So that's a very quick example. I'll just play it back so you can hear it. Oh, I've got myself muted. Say well done overall. Um, so we can go. give general this feedback. Uh, we can give general feedback or we can highlight sections. So I can highlight this little F and then I'm going to record a voice message. This should be in subscript. Um, so we can then say specific things and tag sections with the audio feedback. You can also then combine this and this with um, uh, message feedback, so written feedback, I should say, um, and also add skills on, so you're showing students that they build up the skills, but I think the audio feedback is one of the really cool things with this, very easy to use, it's just as simple as that. Click the button, record, done, and the student receives it in a similar fashion to this. And what we're, what we're picking up, uh, really from across the, well, first of all, we know that assessment and learning happens better with richer feedback, and, and, and we know that, that, that that's, basically what all, all education theory is, is telling us. Uh, what we're also picking up uh, is really this, this type of verbal feedback learners really appreciate and like. Uh, it's a bit less scary than the old red pen. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, so one of the other ones here as well you'll see is called Loom, and I'll quickly show you that here. This is just a plug-in for Google Chrome. I'll open it up. Hopefully you'll see this overlay in the presentation. Um, but basically, it allows me to quickly uh, record screen captures so I can uh, show people screen and my camera, which I'll open up here. It's not going to actually show my camera, is it? I think it's because I've got the feed. There we go. I can use my webcam on my laptop as well. So I can record quick uh, screencasts to people. I can just do screen only. Or I can do cam only as well. 
Um, so what you can use that for is say you've got the essay of a student open, you can record yourself showing them on the screen, moving the mouse around going, this is this, this is this, this is this, um, really giving them that feedback. And also you can have your camera in the corner of the screen, um, which then helps with them. So they've got that, that, that face as well, which helps as well to kind of match the feedback of the person. It's not just a weird voiceless person talking to them. It's, it's a really good tool. Uh, I recommend giving it a go. I think, I think the other neat thing that, that Loom allows for, uh, and I know in a number of universities, uh, things have progressed quite a long way along the route of lecture capture. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps all of the time you don't want it, you're not delivering that big formal lecture, uh, Loom really allows you to capture nice short learning episodes uh, that you can share in a whole lot of ways with, with your learner. Probably, probably a lot more user friendly than some of the big lecture capture systems. Yeah, very easy to use. You just install the plugin, and then it's a couple of button clicks, and you're recording. Um, so those are a couple of feedback tools for you. So we're starting to run low on time, so we'll, we'll quickly cover a couple of things. I'll just mention that on the forums, you can get access to them on nmis-skills.org if you go to the community and then forum section. Uh, we'd like you to kind of discuss on there with some of the other people who are attending the webinars and going through the website of what other tools could be used to give audio or video feedback. You might have some ones that you're using already. You might have some ideas of how the ones that we've demonstrated today could be used. Or you might just want to generally discuss what we've covered in today's webinar. And that's all available on the forums. But um, that's the kind of prompt question that we want people to be talking about is sharing other tools that they're using for those two things. Um, so please do go on to nmis-skills.org and get involved in that forum discussion. And secondly, our teaching challenge for today. These are our little challenges to get you out there and getting using things, giving it a go before you kind of forget about it and then uh, kind of put it on the back burner for a year, is use either Kaizen or Loom or another app that you've seen today to give some feedback to your students. Just go out and do it, maybe just with a couple who are, who are quite uh, tech savvy that, that aren't gonna struggle with it. You won't need to show them too much how to do it. Very, very simple things and you can send to them instantly. So go and give them a go. And just to wrap things up, we're gonna have a quick another discussion of what solutions have you found for deploying digital assessments? Is there anyone in the chat um, who's come up with some good solutions of how they use digital assessment? Um, some people there are saying they will give Kaizen it a go. That's really good to hear. It is, it is cool and very easy to use. You just need to install it in Google Docs. Um, don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on deploying digital assessments. Other people are asking where you download the plugin, and if you actually just do a search, you'll, you'll find the plugin. Yeah, quite also, quickly. all these uh, the slide decks available as well for you to download and get access to as well. So that will I'll help you out. Uh, ah, yeah, someone's saying they use emails feedback. Yeah, that is a good way of actually doing digital assessment feedback. Very simple, and you're going to have access to it in every institution. Mark up the essays and email it back. That is still using digital tools. Um, We've only got about a minute left, so I'm afraid we're not really going to have time to go through uh, too much stuff. Um, someone saying that email was used as a fallback by the US Army for giving feedback to people. So yeah, and that's the thing of like having these reliable tools is always useful uh, of just having a backup. Um, like it's very rare you're going to need a backup tool with a lot of these. They're very, very reliable, but then you can still use things like email and some other things. And your institutions probably have some. Speak to your institutional learning technologists. Well, I but, think um, a lot of the time people will be using Turnitin or, or, or some of the other marking tools that come with your, with your, with, with your VLE. Uh, I just think some of these other tools give you that bit of richer feedback. Yeah, indeed. So we're going to have to wrap things up there. So thanks for uh, coming along and listening in and participating as well. Some really good questions from the chat. Sorry we didn't have time to go through everything. There's the quick credits for the webinar, and we'll hopefully see you at the next one. Okay. Catch you soon. Bye-bye now.